Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Adrian Tag from Columbia University. Uh, it's really great to see everybody here today at Black Hat. Uh, and thank you, Black Hat, for inviting me here for, uh, for this talk. Uh, so this talk that I'm going to be talking about today is, uh, is a joint work with my advisors back in Colombia, uh, Sal Stofo and uh, Simha Madhavan. And today we're really excited to uh, share with you how we broke energy management, a uh, very fundamental component that we see in a lot of systems that we have today. And uh, we call this new class of uh, attack vector uh, clock screw. So first, a brief uh, bio of myself. Uh, I'm currently doing my PhD in Columbia University. Uh, I belong to two labs over there, IDS Lab and the Computer Architecture Lab. Uh, for a huge part of my research, I do a lot of uh, reverse engineering, uh, a lot of bug hunting, created a couple of fuzzes, and, uh, and also do a couple of like, uh, malware and analysis. Uh, focus a lot on security issues that are related to uh, hardware and software interfaces. So now about energy management. So today, as we know it, energy management is uh, uh, indispensable. In fact, none of the systems that we have today can actually exist without energy management. And this is because, as we shown in the chart over here, energy density is getting at a totally ridiculous point. As, uh, as we try to cram as much uh, more and more functionality into like, smaller and smaller chips, we can create hot spots in them. So much so that um, if we don't manage the energy well, it might create the, the battery might drain really quickly, or worse, we might even burn a hole in the chip. So because this is so important, uh, practitioners in the industry and uh, researchers in the academia, they have gone to great lengths just to optimize the way we manage energy uh, consumption. So this is clearly very important in the industry and both in the, in the academia too. So in summary, we have this mechanism, energy management, uh, that we cannot live without and is found on almost all the systems and is extremely complicated. So this is a perfect storm for security and yet no studies have actually looked at this. And so in this work, uh, we study the mechanisms and show that these uh, systems can be fragile in terms of uh, security. So our attack idea is this. Through software, we try to manipulate the energy manage, uh, management parameters to stretch the operational limits uh, of the devices in a way that it induces faults in security critical uh, software. So why is this cool? Uh, because this allows us to sidestep uh, all the requirements of traditional fault attacks like needing physical uh, proximity, separate equipment, crocodile clips, and all the messy business. But more importantly, it opens up a very new attack surface uh, on something very pervasive in systems. And it also raises the possibility of doing fault attacks remotely. So just to summarize it all, uh, in a nutshell, what have we achieved in this work? Uh, we found a new software-based attack vector uh, that exploits uh, a mechanism found in uh, almost all systems. Uh, we show that this vector can be used to break uh, trust zone or the security guarantees of trusted execution environment. Uh, we disclose our, our findings to the vendors whose chips are going to millions and hundreds of uh, devices out there. And the vendors have accepted our disclosure as uh, highly critical and novel and are currently working towards mitigation and fixes. And uh, finally, we hope that the security uh, can be duly considered in uh, future designs of all the systems. This is an overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, first, we'll pick apart uh, what we can about the hardware and software support for DVFS. Uh, DVFS is a very commonly used uh, energy management technique. I'm going to talk more about that later. Uh, and then, based on what we learn, uh, we're going to be talking about the general uh, attack architecture. And finally, we'll describe in detail how we pull off two trust zone attacks on an actual phone. So first up about DVFS and deep dive into the uh, hardware regulators. <clears throat> now there are two main factors that affect uh, energy consumption, the operating frequency and voltage. Think of uh, frequency as how much, uh, how fast a system can process the data. The higher the frequency, the more energy consumed. Uh, you can think of uh, voltage as uh, how much power to supply to the system and more voltage, the more energy will be consumed. Now, DVFS saves the energy by turning these two knobs based on runtime computing demands. Uh, it's a little bit like putting, putting a rubber band over these two knobs and carefully adjusting both at the same time. So, of course, it sketches DVFS at a very, very high level. Uh, but in practice, how are frequency and voltage actually changed on your phone? So this is possible due to a combination of hardware and software support for DVFS. Uh, at the hardware level, uh, we have the circuit level hardware regulators and uh, that they control the frequency and voltage uh, at the hardware level. Now at the software level, we have the power governors that monitor the runtime usage and initiate frequency and voltage changes using the device drivers. 
Now, by starting the source code of the device driver, we know that the software can control the hardware regulators via memory map registers. And this is really interesting because now we know that software can affect some physical characteristics of the hardware that is running on. And so we focus our, uh, our study on the regulators and their interfaces. For this work, we will focus on starting an actual ARM V7 <coughs> uh, phone, so specifically the Nexus uh, 6 ARM V7 phone. For illustration, <coughs> we, here we show the schematics of the frequency and the voltage regulators that we reverse engineer from the uh, Nexus device. Now, the important point to note here is on this, uh, the schematics, these regulators are all configurable from uh, the software through the memory map registers. I won't elaborate the details for this. Uh, so if you're interested, I've uh, made available the source code that I use. I created the, a driver that allows you to uh, manipulate the voltage and the frequency. And I give the link over here. <clears throat> So after creating the driver uh, to programmatically uh, control the frequency and the voltage at runtime, this is where uh, things starts to get really uh, interesting because for certain values of frequency and the voltages, uh, we begin to see really interesting crashes. For example, programs will start to terminate uh, prematurely or even like, you know, UI will stop uh, working. So this is a screenshot of what happened when we tried to like, raise the frequency past a specific point uh, in combination with uh, some other voltages. Um, <clears throat> So we played around with different settings, uh, even with like different temperatures. Um, the picture that you see over here, this is a, basically a picture of my, uh, my fridge, uh, my laptop, and my phone, which is actually in the freezer, which you cannot see in the, in the picture here. So I got to say, this fridge has been really useful in my research. Uh, but clearly, my wife is not very excited about me putting like random phones in the, in the fridge. But anyway, we, we decided to like, uh, dig a little bit further into this. So now we, we want to know that the software can control the uh, frequency and the voltage, right? A fair question for us to ask is whether any limits are actually imposed uh, on uh, this configuration at runtime. So essentially what we want to do is to configure different frequency and voltage points on an actual phone, uh, and then we want to track when bad things happen. Uh, and we need to do this like, systematically. There's a couple of things we need to do. So now we know we can observe and probe like the, the phone for unintended computing behaviors, uh, like crashing and free, uh, freezes. We know we can control the frequency and the voltage. We need to also be able to verify that the frequency and the voltage are actually changed uh, according to what we want. So how do we actually do that? So fortunately, if we have the debug FS interface enabled, uh, there are actually sensors on the thing which you can access, uh, and you can probe to see what the frequency and the voltage is on the actual phone. Uh, so short of using, like, you know, opening the phone up and uh, using physical instrument to probe for all this physical, uh, like the frequency and the voltage, we can use the debug statement over here to get uh, information directly. So these commands are actually more uh, convenient here for us. So now let's, let's explore this a little bit more, use the, the various operating points for the frequency and the voltage, right? So what we have here is a Nexus 6 device. Uh, this is advertised to run uh, at 2.7 gigahertz, and we measure the, the vendor recommended frequency and voltage at runtime. So the frequency is uh, the y-axis, and on the x-axis you have the voltage. And uh, after measurement, we observe several discrete frequency and voltage operating points here. So true enough, uh, well, the vendors are definitely not lying to us, because if you look at the top rightmost corner of that, the highest frequency of 2.7 gigahertz uh, is really as advertised there. So they're definitely not lying. Now, we use the software interfaces that we've uncovered earlier on uh, to control the frequency and voltage. <clears throat> and then for every voltage, we try to raise the frequency all the way up until we see some signs of instability on the phone. So this can range from apps crashing or you know, the device or rebooting. And then we measure like, the frequency and the voltage and plot the points over here. Now, these are the operating points, uh, the blue points that we see over here on the graph is the points that we uh, try to push it all the way up. So these are the, what we have actually measured from there. As we can see from this graph, uh, two things are actually uh, apparent here. One, there are really no safeguard limits in the hardware regulators here, uh, despite what the, uh, uh, the vendors are advertised here. And two, when we reduce the voltage, uh, this also reduces the uh, minimum frequency we need to get some kind of instability on the phone. So all these things starts to get really interesting. And more, uh, more interestingly, we tried on different kind of phones, and besides the Nexus 6, we also found similar behaviors in the other devices. Now that we know that we can change the frequency and voltage with no limits, the next thing we want to assess here is uh, how dangerous it is on the commodity devices. 
Uh, as we all know, like ARM devices comes with uh, the Trust Zone technology that isolate trusted execution environment. Um, we can perhaps uh, affect the frequency and voltage while the Trust Zone code is running, and maybe we can do something interesting over there. <clears throat> so this is a simplified view of a Trust Zone and uh, enabled uh, ARM core. So basically what Trust Zone uh, does is that it, it isolates the trusted code uh, on, on the left uh, from the un untrusted code on the right. And in our research, we found that the underlying uh, regulators, uh, they operate across this, uh, the security boundaries. Both the trust zone code and the normal untrusted code, they share the same frequency in the voltage regulators that you have in the core. So when the untrusted code changes the frequency and the voltages uh, of the regulators, it also affects the, the, the execution of the trusted code within the trust zone. So now we know we can affect the execution of the trust zone code from outside trust zone. Next, about the actual attack. Ultimately, what we want to ask, can we actually attack the trust zone code execution from outside trust zone using purely software-only control of the regulators? The idea is to push the frequency and the voltage uh, past the operating points and, to, and induce some kind of like timing faults in there. So ultimately, we want to break uh, uh, the confidentiality and the uh, integrity guarantees of trust zone. Know that we're not trying to, uh, we're not looking at availability attacks because uh, they're trivial to, to break over here. But before we talk about injecting faults, I, I want to just uh, give a quick overview, a quick sketch on why faults occur on the systems, uh, yeah, what happened in the underlying electrical circuit. So now if you look at the devices we have today, uh, all the uh, digital circuits are made up of electronic components, and uh, we call them flip-flops. Think of them as uh, elements that uh, hold some kind of state, say uh, the bit one or zero, and each flip-flop has uh, an input and output. And because there are so many flip-flops, they need to coordinate the, uh, the operation using a common clock. So the flip-flops can only change their, their states uh, together at each uh, clock pulse, and data needs to flow from one flip-flop to the next one. And usually there's some kind of intermediate path in between. So say we want to transfer this bit one from this end all the way to the other end. <clears throat> and then it actually uh, it takes some time to propagate the data bit. Uh, but more importantly, it actually needs to do it within the consecutive pulses of the clock uh, signal. And so there's actually a hard timing uh, deadline in some sense. So now we want to transfer the bit zero instead of one uh, to the other end. So what happens when we increase the frequency too much uh, beyond what the, uh, the, the, the vendors have actually advertised? It means that the clock pulses uh, they have to occur more frequently in the same amount of time. And since the uh, flip-flop changes the states only at the pulses, this means that the data have less time to propagate through the intermediate path that they have in between. So as a result of that, the output uh, is supposed to be zero, but it remains as the old value, which is one. And at a higher level, this basically means that uh, it, it, uh, it results in a, a perceived uh, bit flip of zero to one. So this is essentially how the fault actually happens uh, in the context of flip-flops. So what are some of the possible security implications of uh, inducing faults using software-based uh, overclocking, for example? So to get, to get an initial assessment of this, we created two simple victim programs, uh, just for exploration, and then we used the tool that we discussed earlier to uh, manipulate the frequency and voltage. So now in the first example, we will show how the control flow of an actual program uh, can be influenced. So I'm gonna show a quick video over here. Uh, so on the left here, we run our victim program. You can see it spin loops for a while, checks for some conditions, and then it fills the authentication. The expected thing is the authentication will be a will fill. And then uh, after that, while it's running, we're gonna run it again. And then we will run a code on a separate call as an attacker, we change and increase the frequency all the way up uh, while the during the second time we run the victim program. And here, we see how the, uh, the victim program actually uh, behaves very differently across while the, uh, the overclocking actually happens. In the first one, it failed, and the second one, it actually passed. So the control flow of the program was actually influenced in this case. In the second example, uh, we want to show how overclocking can cause arithmetic uh, computation to create, to produce uh, the er errors. So on the left here, we have our victim program. Uh, we're going to run it. So you run a couple of uh, computation, mathematic computation, it should return the numbers 0, 1, and 2. We're going to run it again, do the overclocking. we just wait for a while and see what happens. So 
we're supposed to be expecting zero, one, and two. I'm not sure whether it's, uh, it's uh, pretty visible here, but uh, we're supposed to expect one, uh, zero, one, two, but for when we overclock the thing, the first number that came out for that would be an invalid number. So by using overclocking, you can actually influence the data flow as well as the corruption of the, uh, the data that's being computed from uh, the unit. So what we have earlier is a uh, very simple programs. Unfortunately, pro many programs that we want to attack, uh, they're more complicated. And uh, we were playing around with this and we realized that to pull it off, to pull, indu uh, pull off the inducing a fault in an actual self-contained device uh, entirely from software is actually very, very challenging. So these are some of the challenges we have to, uh, we have to overcome. Uh, we will outline some of these challenges and then briefly sketch how we address them. So for one, uh, overclocking requires being able to set the frequency way past the suggested value. And we have seen earlier that the hardware regulators, they have no limits uh, based on our earlier exploration. In fact, any operating points uh, above the blue uh, dots over there in the graph uh, is a possible candidate that we can use for the attack. And the, both the attack and the victim codes have to execute on the same device. So how do we prevent the attack code from attacking itself or attacking something, some other non-victim code that we don't want to attack at all? So for this, we exploit the emerging trend where energy management techniques, uh, mechanisms are getting more and more fine-grained. So many devices such as the one that we attack uh, have separate frequency uh, regulators on, on the core. So with that in mind, we, we pin the, uh, the threat execution of the attack and the victim codes to separate cores, and this helps to isolate the, the effects of the fault injection just to the victim threat that we want. And the environment that we're attacking is, in a, is a complex full uh, OS, and to deal with that, carefully design the attack uh, to disable the, uh, the interrupts during the window of the attack. So coupled with uh, core pinning, this reduced a lot of noise during our attack. And finally, for many attack scenarios, we need very, very precise timing as to when <coughs> the fault uh, should be inject, uh, in injected and for how long. So we need very fine-grained timing resolutions. So for example, to give a, a sense of like, uh, the difficulty, uh, in one of our attack scenarios, we have to inject a fault within a small window of about uh, 65,000 clock cycles uh, within an entire victim threat execution that actually takes about 1.1 billion clock cycles. So that is the skill that we're actually looking at. So for timing resolution, we rely on assembly level uh, no-ops loops for high precision timing delays. And to guide the timing of the fault delivery, we rely on cache uh, side channel based uh, profiling techniques. So more about that later. So now <clears throat> for the attacks. We explore two attacks here. In the first attack, we break confidentiality by inferring the secret AES key that is stored in Trust Zone. And in the second attack, uh, we show how Trust Zone, uh, how Clock Screw can uh, trick Trust Zone into uh, loading a self signed application. So let's talk about the first attack. So the threat model is this uh, we have an AES decryption application that's running within uh, Trust Zone. It uses a secret key that cannot be accessed from the non secure normal world. Now, the attacker wants to extract this secret key out from the trust zone. And we assume that the attacker outside trust zone can repeatedly invoke uh, this decryption application. And we assume that the attacker has software uh, access to the hardware regulators, so he can actually uh, inject this uh, fault during the decryption operation. So what we want to do is this, in this attack is this. We want to induce the fault while the AES decryption is happening within trust zone. And here we show an expected operation where we get the correct plain text from the decryption. So now we will invoke the decryption operation again, but this time uh, we will induce a timing fault at the decryption level uh, to result in the faulty plain text. And then using this pair of correct and faulty plain text, we can run uh, a technique which we call, uh, we, uh, is a well-known technique using like a differential fault analysis that allows us to infer the secret key uh, based on this pair of uh, correct and faulty plain text. So to induce a timing fault to the decryption execution, uh, there are, uh, these are some of the parameters that we use for the attacks. Uh, the hardest part of the attack is to figure out how to inject a one byte fault uh, to the seventh AES round during the, the decryption. So very briefly on how the differential fault analysis work, uh, by corrupting the first, the one, one byte in the seventh AES uh, round, this introduces a fault into the eighth AES round key. 
So this diagram shows how this fault actually propagates through like the remaining AES uh, rounds. Ultimately, at the end of it, what we'll get is a, a system of equation, basically a set of constraints that we can use to reduce the, the key search space. Uh, you can check out the code at the following uh, link over here. <clears throat> So luckily, we can also profile the uh, execution timing of the trust zone code using hardware, uh, hardware cycle counters. So even when we're actually outside trust zone, we can access that. This allows us to perform timing uh, profiles of the uh, profiling of the victim applications from outside trust zone. So the first question we ask is this. How long does the uh, decryption operation actually take? Does it vary from run to run? Because if it changes too much, uh, we're going to have a tough time uh, uh, injecting the fault to wherever we want. So here we plot a histogram uh, of the execution time of the decryption. Uh, we see that more than 80% of the invocation actually takes between 800 to 900,000 clock cycle. So in terms of execution time, there's not much variability. And next, on the attacker side of things, recall that we're using the number of uh, no-op loops uh, to time the uh, delivery of the default. So is this an accurate uh, proxy that we use to control the timing? Uh, so here we plot the number of no-op loops uh, that we use before the fault uh, injection against the execution duration of the attack threat. And we see a clear predictable linear trend here. So this parameter that we use for the fault injection is actually a good proxy uh, for us to time when we do the fault injection. So our differential fault analysis requires uh, our fault model to achieve two things. We need to uh, exactly corrupt only one byte in the seventh AES round. Now we evaluate how feasible that is. Uh, and how likely can we inject a fault in exactly one AES round? Here we plot a frequency histogram of the number of AES rounds uh, where the, the fault actually occurs. And we see that more than 60% of the resulting faults here are precise enough to affect exactly one round. So essentially, we have, uh, <clears throat> we have uh, quite a good uh, success rate to that one. And in terms of transients, how likely can we corrupt exactly just one byte? Here we plot the frequency, uh, frequency histogram of the number of corrupted bytes. Uh, when one AES uh, round is actually uh, faulted, we see that out of the above faults that affect one round, more than half are actually transient enough to corrupt exactly one byte. Yep. So we will end, up with, uh, end this first uh, uh, attack with a summary of the results for this attack. This, that is evident that we can actually control the no-op no loops uh, before the fault delivery. Uh, this allows us to precisely time when we want to do this. So it takes roughly about 20 attempts uh, to induce a one-byte fault uh, to the desired AES round. So subsequently then, once we have the faulty and the correct uh, plain text, we can conduct a differential fault analysis. It takes roughly about 12 minutes uh, to get about 3,600 uh, key hypotheses. After that, we can just brute force for the correct key. And now for the second attack. Now in this second attack, uh, we want to attack the RSA signature verification uh, routine within the trust zone firmware. So on an actual phone, the apps running within trust zone are basically building blocks for like security. So these apps are loaded at runtime from binary uh, blob files that you can find from the, the firmware. And each of the app uh, binary block files actually comes with a certificate chain uh, of digital signatures that ultimately the Trust Zone OS would use to verify the authenticity of uh, the app file just before loading the thing. So if it fails, it won't load that. So here's our threat model for the attack scenario. Uh, as an attacker, we want to trick the app loading routine to accept a self-signed binary that we created and we assume that the attacker can repeatedly uh, invoke the trust zone to load an applica uh, application file. And clearly, we need to have software access to the regulators, and we also need to be easily, we can easily tell if an app has been loaded successfully just based on the return uh, value of the invocation. So the attack, general attack idea is this, right? So we want to self-sign this uh, app binary and then invoke the app loading uh, while the trust zone is verifying the signature that we provide. Uh, then we want to actually inject the, the, the fault in there. So we want to do that such that the RSA modulus that is actually being used at runtime, it gets corrupted to a value that we can actually predict and use. And essentially, this, if this uh, RSA uh, modulus can be factorized, we can then generate our own private key and then generate a signature that we can use to trick the thing. So to pull this attack off, uh, we need to explore two things. Number one, 
how do we craft the self-signed binary applications that we want to load into the trust zone? And two, how does the, the RSA signature uh, verification actually work? Uh, how is it actually implemented in there? How, when, and where do we inject the fault in there? So first, let's investigate the format of the application uh, binary files. So for the phone, the phone that we are exploring, uh, the trust zone app files can be found in the firmware updates or on the phone device itself. You can just extract them out. And each of the app consists of a collection of files here, uh, basically a .mdt file uh, that contains the, uh, the certificate chain, a bunch of metadata and uh, the digital signatures is being used. Uh, and then we have a series of like uh, the program files here. So since the signature and the hashes uh, and the uh, uh, certificate chain are all in the app.mdt file, uh, we be, we're just going to focus on the, our analysis on that one. And we'll just be attacking that one. So let's zoom into the format of the .mdt file. So here is a pictorial view of what you can find in a .mdt, uh, MDT file that you, you, you can get from the firmware. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge Tal and Gal from uh, uh, Google Project, uh, Project Zero for their valuable work on reversing the, uh, the format of the .mdt file. So from their work, we know that the certificate is stored in, uh, in a proprietary Motorola HAB binary format. So let's zoom into an actual certificate that is found on uh, the white vine application on, uh, that will run within Trust Zone on the phone. So since the public uh, exponent E is usually fixed, is always fixed to uh, 10001, uh, so uh, in fact, only the modulus N uh, and the signature is actually of interest uh, during our analysis. Uh, and if you're interested, I made a copy of my, uh, my certificate uh, parsing code here at the link here. If you want, you can go play around with that, uh, download the, the firmware and pass the certificate yourself. <clears throat> Next, uh, we want to dive into the uh, Trust Zone OS code that does the uh, signature verification. So I know many of you already know this, uh, but let's quickly just review how the signatures are verified, uh, just so that we are all on the same page. Um, say you have some blob of binary data that you want to you protect, and together with an attached uh, certificate uh, to prove its authenticity. So to verify that this, uh, this binary data that you want to protect, uh, the first thing you have to do is first get, get, get the hash of the data. So over here, in, the, in fact, on the phone itself, it uses SHA-256. And then now we assume that there's some kind of root-trusted uh, root key that is embedded in the, uh, in the, in the firmware uh, and is actually trusted. And uh, using the modulus of the root key, we can then decrypt the signature that we, we find from the, the certificate and then to finally get hash two. And then to do the actual verification of the signature, uh, what we do at the end of that is to verify that the two hashes actually match. If they don't match the certificate, uh, the signature verification will fail. So this works because when someone tries to modify the binary data, uh, the resulting hash will not match uh, the hash value that is finally decrypted from the signature that we have over here. So well then, that, why, why do we need to inject a fault at runtime? The biggest reason is because the root verifying key is actually fixed within the, uh, the firmware. Uh, so even if we try to change the signature in a way that uh, without knowing what the, uh, the private key for the modulus is going to be, uh, the resulting decrypt, uh, decrypted hash is extremely unlikely to match over here. So the one play that we have left is to inject a fault while the decryption function here is running. So that, it becomes, so that the modulus that is actually being used at runtime uh, is one that we can actually factorize and uh, hold the corresponding private key to. And then we can actually generate the desired intended hash uh, over here. So let's figure out how to inject a fault into uh, the decryption function here. Well, this all this in theory. So the devil is usually in all the in the in the details. So we'll need to analyze the binary of the trust zone code uh, for, firmware to formulate the attack properly. So we download the trust zone firmware from the vendor's website. We assemble it. Look at that. So in this trust zone uh, firmware, here's an example of the super super root key that we found in here, and we know the RSA uh, 2048 uh, bit is actually being used. And digging further. We found the, 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 the function that decrypts a given uh, signature uh, using like a public modulus and the exponent key. So this is a screenshot of the disassembled uh, uh, function. 
So with a bit of re reversing, uh, we figure out the exact implementation of the RSA decryption function from the disassembly. So for your reference here, this is the uh, pseudocode for the function. So this is extremely crucial for us to figure out where and how to inject the fault. So just as a side note, I'd just like to add that besides staring at the disassembly statically, uh, I found that using code emulation, using uh, the Anger framework <clears throat> has been really helpful in testing out the hypothesis uh, of the reverse uh, functionality. So kudos to the uh, UCSB team for this really great tool. Uh, and in addition, uh, I've also devised a cool debugging trick that allows me to dynamically instrument the trust zone code running on actual phones itself, on the phone that I'm actually uh, looking at. So this trick allows me to set uh, virtual breakpoints and uncover contents of the data structure uh, that is only available at runtime. Uh, I won't have time to cover this in this talk, so hopefully I can cover it next time in a separate talk in future. So anyway, let's, let's dig further into this, this function that we have right now. Uh, at a high level, this function computes the modular uh, exponentiation on uh, the signature given to it. So it is impl implemented with uh, an efficient form of uh, multiplication uh, routine uh, called uh, Montgomery. Uh, you can have more information over there. And finally, it uses a memory intensive function that reverses the uh, memory buffers over here. Use it into uh, three different spots here. Uh, and it deals with like the modulus and uh, with the signature and finally with uh, uh, an intermediate value of the, the decrypted signature. So now the first question to ask is, um, where in this function do we inject uh, this runtime for? Ideally, we want, to have, we want a code section that meddles with uh, the given modulus. And after some trial and error, we found that the function uh, flip endedness is very, very susceptible to faults. Furthermore, its invocation at line four is used to reverse the, uh, the modulus uh, supplied as an argument. So for reference, uh, this is zoom up this disassembly and the corresponding uh, pseudocode of the flip endedness function. Uh, by exploring various values of the faulting uh, parameters, here, uh, here is a set of uh, parameters that actually work reliably for us uh, in comparing a compute, corrupting the output of flip endedness. So this is an example of the corrupted uh, modulus uh, that we see in our ex experiments. We can see how one particular byte in this modulus gets corrupted to a value of its uh, neighboring byte. So in, to, to aid in our exploration, we created a test bench, which allows us to quickly swap out like binaries of functions that we want to test uh, and see whether are they actually uh, uh, susceptible to faults. We provide the code that we want to test as a, a binary blob to this test bench. So for a demo and a source code for the test bench, uh, please refer to this link. Uh, probably won't have time to actually show this demo. And then the next stack, uh, next issue that we want to tackle is this. We want how do we actually craft the attacks in nature that we want, given that we already know what the, uh, the uh, decryption function is going to be. <clears throat> so it turns out to be trickier than we expected. Uh, when we, before we started, we had this general idea of what we want to do. But uh, again, looking at the, the, the implementation is a little bit more tricky. So the biggest problem actually lies in line three and four. So if you look at line three and four, uh, we see how the original modulus n gets corrupted to the new n at line four. And previously at line three, the original n is still being used by line three. And uh, it's tricky because if we fast forward to line 15, uh, the Montgomery multiplication function over here uses both the, uh, the original n, the original n, and the corrupted n over here. Uh, so this gets really, really tricky over here. And we formulated a technique to solve this, allowing us to generate a, uh, a, an attack in nature given both the moduli. So I want to talk about this here. Uh, please refer to the white paper and uh, the Python script that I have to generate this attack in nature. So now that we know what to attack and how to attack, we need to figure out when to inject the fault. So by reversing the trust zone firmware, we know that the decrypt, uh, decrypt signature function is actually invoked four times. Uh, when verifying an application binary, we can attack any one of those invocations. So we pick the fourth invocation for our attack. So to profile the, uh, the trust zone code from outside trust zone, we exploit a design issue in there uh, where the memory accesses from outside trust zone uh, can actually evict or remove the, uh, the, the cache lines used by trust zone. So this opens up a range of side channel based uh, profiling attacks and we rely on the cache based ones over here. 
we found that by doing uh, prime and pro uh, pro uh, profiling on instruction caches is more reliable than data caches. Uh, we won't describe the, the side channel based profiling attack on the arm. Uh, here are some of the references to them. So it turns out that iCache profiling um, is not as convenient as uh, data cache uh, profiling because instead of using memory read operations, we actually need to execute, execute the, uh, the instructions at the memory addresses that are congruent to the, uh, uh, the cache set that we are monitoring. So we created a, uh, a JIT compiler, a JIT compiler, such that given a, a list of uh, cache set you want to monitor, you would allocate and execute a block of executed memory. And then we put in like uh, uh, the branch instruction in there and then chain all the relative branch instructions together that is uh, congruent to the monitor set. So here's a sketch of uh, uh, how we do the, uh, the whole iCache uh, profiling. Uh, we have a, a target victim, that, uh, victim code that we want to try to uh, monitor for. Uh, we try to pick a couple of code areas just before that, and we monitor for the iCache uh, eviction for this cache set simultaneously. Uh, we, in our experiments, in our attacks, we actually monitor for four sets, cache sets at the same time. Say uh, you have an E, uh, which is the event when all this cache set is found to be evicted, and then you want to track the next, you track the next time that E actually happens, uh, we do that using like incremental, uh, incrementing counters uh, as a high precision timer to track the duration between the consecutive E's. So we call this duration between consecutive cache eviction events, uh, G. So with this time series G, uh, I'm gonna show over here, is this is actually a very uh, nice uh, fine green proxy of the trust zone code execution that we can use to analyze or profile trust zone code. So to look for a timing anchor for our fault injection, uh, let's see how useful this, this feature, this time series G is. So on the Y axis, uh, we plot the G interval while the X axis is, uh, is the time. The general time series pattern of G is uh, similar whenever trust zone is uh, in the process of validating the fourth uh, signature. So we exploit this pattern to create additional features that we can use to fine tune uh, our timing anchor. So these are the main uh, handcrafted features we use based on the time series G. Now to track uh, a fault, uh, we track the fault success as when our targeted modulus buffer is actually corrupted. And here we see both features are uh, both features that we have uh, plotted as a scatter plot. So you have the cache, the first feature or as the y axis, and then the second feature as the x axis. See that for both features are indicative of uh, the fault uh, success rate. You kind of see this like a, a downward sloping uh, relationship over here. But these features alone are actually not enough. So you look at this uh, scatter plot over here. Uh, this scatter plot actually plots uh, on the y axis, it plots uh, the position of where, which part of the buffer is actually being corrupted. And the x axis is how much time do we wait before we actually inject this thing in there. So ideally, you want to see like a straight line, but it's definitely not a straight line over here. There's a lot of variability. Uh, it's tough to pinpoint the, uh, the fault injection to a particular thing. So if you look at that, uh, if we use a fixed value of uh, the, the number of delays uh, before we inject the fault, uh, it actually corrupts a wide range of, uh, a wide range of uh, the positions within the, the actual buffer itself. So it's very tough for us to actually pinpoint which, buffer, which position within the buffer we want to corrupt. So this is actually problematic for our attack because then we won't be able to reliably, uh, reliably predict what the values are gonna be. So the idea that we have is this. Instead of using a fixed delay uh, before the, the, the fault injection, uh, we need to somehow devise um, an adaptive delay that we can use uh, based on runtime conditions uh, to target the specific positions that we want in, in the modulus. So this is the final piece to our attack. Uh, so this is, uh, we use the uh, linear regression models to base, uh, by collect a whole bunch of uh, empirical uh, fault observations. And we found that including additional features like temperature, uh, and uh, they actually help to increase like the accuracy of our models. So now with these models, we can then adjust our, the delay that we need uh, to time the thing uh, and target a specific positions within the modulus buffer given several runtime conditions. And how accurate is that? So we see that uh, this is a histogram of the frequency of the faults uh, across where in the, the buffer is actually uh, uh, corrupted. So the x-axis here actually shows where in the buffer. The buffer is about 256 uh, 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 bytes. 
and where in the buffer it actually gets corrupted more. So we want to try to target somewhere in between the buffer. Uh, so now we can see it's kind of like there's a, a, a normal distribution of the thing. Uh, so some statistics on that. <clears throat> Uh, for 20, uh, roughly about 20% of the faulting attempts that we want uh, results in a successful desired uh, fault in, in the buffer that we want. So this fault actually consists of roughly about 805 unique uh, values, of which uh, about 5% are, are, are factorizable. And one instance of the desired uh, fault we tried out, uh, in roughly about 65 faulting attempts, uh, one of them actually result in the fault that we want, and we actually managed to get the app to load in there. So I want to briefly summarize like all the different uh, attack enablers uh, that allows us to pull off this attack. Uh, so this is a, a, sum, a summary list of that. So the main thing is uh, it summarizes like most of the design issues that we find on the architectural design of uh, energy management mechanisms on the systems these days. Uh, one of the biggest issues is uh, the fact that uh, it's not just one specific uh, uh, design issue in the thing is actually a combination of that that allows us to pull off all these different attacks here. So now I want to try to uh, have some concluding remarks for this. So we know that the, the, the industry is definitely trending towards the final grain and increasingly uh, heterogeneous design. So as a result, we're going to see uh, more and more designs giving uh, software more control over the energy management. So we probably see this on 64-bit uh, ARM architecture and the newer in Intel processes, or even on, the, on some of the cloud computing providers that are giving VM gas more control uh, over power management. So thinking about the security ramification of all these different designs is definitely uh, required. So there are possible defenses both on the hardware and software level. Uh, but one thing is, um, is, is clear is that there is actually no clear defense that we can use that can entirely prevent um, clock screw style of attacks. Because many of the design decisions are, that contribute to the possibility of this attack, um, they're in fact driven by real practical engineering concerns. And a lot of full system, uh, most probably like a full system response is needed for an effective defense. So to round up the talk, I'll briefly highlight some of the key takeaways from this work. Uh, we discover a new class of uh, attack vectors, mainly enabled by the software interfaces of uh, energy management mechanisms. And we show that it can actually be used and exploited by attackers to attack a uh, trusted execution environment. And ultimately, this is not a hardware or software bug. It results from the fundamental uh, design flaws uh, of the energy management mechanisms. As such, the uh, future energy management designs must uh, take security into consideration, especially in the context of the use of uh, hardware enforced isolation. Uh, so these are some of the links that I have for the, uh, uh, for, uh, made available. Uh, this is uh, related to clock screw. And uh, with that, I'm uh, happy to take questions. Hello, thank you for this talk. Um, would it be possible to protect for this kind of attacks by protecting and restricting the access to the registers that control frequency and voltage from the trust zone, thus allowing to, to develop uh, control, the control mechanism you request for the hardware, but within software? Um, yes, it's definitely possible. This is actually one of the possible approach in trying to solve this thing. That is, but the key thing is that you need to make sure that the enforcement is actually done at the trust zone level and actually not from outside trust zone. That way, the trust zone can actually better protect itself because if you put it outside, then that's going to be a problem. But of course, uh, there's a lot of implication in terms of like the, the overhead, the amount of overhead that you're going to be, uh, you're going to have to expect when you put this kind of enforcement logic in there. Yep. Um, as far as I understand, yeah. um, the, the victim is executing in the trust zone and the, the, and the target is in the trust zone and the attacker is in the normal world. Uh, so it means that it's possible to have one core uh, working in the trust zone and the other core working in the normal world and working in parallel? The... Yes, that is possible. Okay. That is why the attack works. Okay. And uh, the other question is, um, you talked about uh, hardware cycle con counters accessible from normal world that uh, allows to monitor the secure world. Mm -hmm. uh, could you uh, elaborate on that? Uh, how is it accessible? Well, what is it? Sure. Uh, so on ARM, there's actually a specific registers that you can actually set uh, that enable the use of hardware cycle counters, uh, even for code that is running within Trust Zone. So for example, from the normal world, 
what you can do is you can go to this register and you set enable. Then what happens is that you can enable this cycle counter, invoke trust zone to do some kind of code that you want, and then when it returns to the normal world, you track how much the value of this cycle count actually changes. Then this value here would be uh, how long the trust zone code actually takes to run. So this is what I meant by that. And ARM design uh, actually al allows you to do this, at least for the 32-bit designs. Is this a feature or? It is a documented feature. They call it a uh, secure debug. So, but you actually have to, uh, yeah, you actually have to, uh, I can't remember whether you enable or disable it, but it's, you look for that one, yeah. I've just got a quick question. How long did it take you to assemble these sophisticated attack to get it running and leak data out of Trust Zone? Um, well, I think the whole, I started working on this um, last year, um, but I finished everything roughly around within one year's time. Um, the exploration of the, uh, one part of that is actually trying to explore how the actual interfaces actually work, trying to reverse engineer the memory map thing. That probably took me about a month. Uh, the bulk of it is actually the reverse engineering of the actual firmware to figure out exactly where we want to do the fault injection, how we want to do the fault injection, and then there's a bunch of different tricky stuff that we actually have to solve uh, that I didn't cover in this specific talk. So I would say it takes roughly about one, one year to pull off two attacks on this trust zone thing. Yep. That's why I wanted to actually share that. Uh, well, the key thing is actually not just not the attack. It's more like the, on the architectural design issues that were it's very critical to the security of the phones that we have these days, and it's something that no one has actually looked at, especially the energy management side of things. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Super cool work. Hi. Uh, Thanks. Uh, I actually I really agree with something you just said. That for me, the interesting part is not that you could build the really complicated injector, or whatever. It's that the design is set up so that this is possible. Yes. And the moment you realize this, right? You can see that there's six months' work to implement it, but that it's going to work. So I'm curious, when you were doing your vendor disclosures, right. um, can you just disclose to them, look, we could do this, or did you, have to, did you have to spend six months building an attack to prove to them that it would work? Um, well, you don't have to. This varies from like, different kind of vendors, right? Uh, based on the vendors that we actually talked to, they were actually very receptive. You do have to show some kind of proof of concept. Uh, it doesn't have to be an end-to-end -end proof of concept, but you have to show that you, know, you can actually pull off uh, corrupting the, some kind of data computation or some kind of control flow influence uh, from outside trust zone within trust zone itself. So you do actually have to show some level of the attackability, uh, but not a full thing like the RSE uh, signature thing. Yep. Yeah, I was wondering if you start maybe looking into um, Intel SGX and... Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so, um, well, actually, I, I looked into Intel before, and I uh, found a whole bunch of uh, undocumented uh, thing in there where you can actually model, uh, you can do like all the, all the power management stuff on Intel, so why not SGX? Uh, but on a security note, uh, on a, a more likely note, uh, there's really no reason why that is not possible, because this is more like an architectural uh, thing rather than an actual uh, micro-architectural thing. So yeah, I have actually never really go all the way down and try to pull out the thing, but I'm sure someone over here would be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah, so I have a question regarding the RSA attack. Sure. So as I understood it, your attack made it possible so that the, this, the signature of your uh, modified software would actually match the signature of the original software um, in the signature verification. Oh, is the, yes, it would match yeah. the output of the signature verification after you glitch it at runtime. Yeah. Yep. So what's the RSA key size on, on uh, Android? Is it 2048 20, bits? So it's a 512 byte result that you need to match them. So, and your attack makes it possible to get incorrect results. So you need to have a, a 512 byte buffer that, that you randomly affect to get the expected value. Uh -huh. So how long did it take you 
when you run the attack, how right. long would it take before you actually find that expected value? Yeah, so when we started, it took a really long time. Um, that's why most of our efforts is based on trying to fine tune this thing, like using the linear regression model and trying to do all of that. Uh, it took, for example, with the linear regression model, it's probably going to take, if you have a script that is actually running, it's probably going to take maybe one or two days, uh, given the number of attempts that you have over there. Okay, so maybe I'm missing something, because one or two days in order to generate a 512-byte buffer, that, that no, sounds really quick. To, yeah. It's not trying to generate the thing. I mean, you're, like, you're, you're trying to pinpoint uh, the corruption of a specific position within that entire buffer. So you're not doing like randomly on all the different kind of uh, position. You want to try to pinpoint that on a specific part of that. And the interesting thing is uh, the, the values that are actually being corrupted is not exactly random. Uh, because actually, if you look at one of the examples that I showed earlier, a lot of times it takes on the neighboring bytes of the, the, the positions. That's why we can a priority kind of predict based on the byte position that is going to be corrupted, what the value of the corrupted byte is going to be. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's why it's not exactly random. Is, uh, if, uh, does it answer your question? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, we, could, we could take yeah. it offline anyway. We can, we can yeah. discuss more mm -hmm. about that. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that in order for these types of attacks to work, you, the values that you set for frequency and voltage need to be significantly outside of vendor specifications. Mm -hmm. um, what uh, mechanisms control the values that you can actually set? Are they controlled by the driver? Um, yeah, and what kind of? So currently on the, the phones that we have today, uh, they are all being controlled by a device driver that the vendor would actually provide, right? Yeah, so, so the, there should be some, some sort of protections to, that yes. this allow you from setting So right up. now on the phones that we have, the enforcement logic, or rather the, uh, the protection logic is all implemented within the device driver. But the device driver is running outside trust zone. So now what we're trying to do is running, it attack something that is within trust zone itself. And the interesting thing is any kind of stuff, any kind of frequency and voltage that you affect from outside trust zone also affects what's within trust zone itself. That's why this attack is possible. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Are you familiar with um, any work? Uh, is it possible to implement some sort of hardware um, protections that just the hardware will not let you um, go outside specific boundaries for these values? Or yeah, there are, I think there are ongoing works that actually look at uh, trying to put some kind of enforcement logic within the actual hardware itself. The reason why is not being, uh, I would speculate, I'm not really that sure, like what the, what the thing would be, but I would speculate that it's actually extremely hard to put some kind of uh, uh, enforcement logic within the hardware at this point in time. Because if you look at the, the production process itself, uh, in order for you to put like the, uh, the enforcement logic, you need to know what are the ranges of the frequency and the voltage. And any enforcement actually have to take into account both the frequency and voltage. So if you just look at the, the if you just enforce the limits of frequency itself or voltage itself, it's not gonna work. Yeah. Because if you look at the graph over there, what you could do is you can pull down the voltage and the amount of, the, the, the amount of frequency that you have to exceed is actually much lower then, right? Yeah. So that's one. Another one is you need to run a lot of extensive tests uh, to get the limits that you need to protect uh, this, uh, the frequency and voltage. But this kind of uh, limits are usually only uh, done when the device has finished production. So it's like a post-manufacturing mm -hmm. thing. Then you test it and you get the values. Now, if you, then it's like a chicken and egg problem, right? So how do you put these values into the hardware at the design phase itself? So, these are some of the issues that actually has to be met uh, or uh, solved uh, in order to save the, solve this specific problem. Yes. Thank you so much. Great talk. Well, if uh, there are no further questions, uh, thank you so much for attending the talk today. Uh, I'll be around. Uh, if you want, you can talk to me offline, uh, or you think of any questions, just shoot me an email. All right? Thank you so much.